We've learned that the great thing about logic is that given the truth of some propositions, some claims about the world, we can be guaranteed the truth of other propositions. And that sounds very useful, right? Something you would really want to know. But exactly how does it work? How does logic guarantee the truth of a proposition? First, let's remember what an argument is. An argument is a sequence of propositions, one of which being the conclusion, the proposition that we're trying to establish, and the rest of which are premises, propositions that we're using to establish that conclusion. Remember, we also said that you can have any finite number, including zero, of premises to establish that conclusion, but you must have one and only one conclusion. The following is an example of an argument given in the book. The rabbit either ran down the left path or the right path. The rabbit did not run down the left path, therefore the rabbit ran down the right path. In the book, uh, Smith says that this is enough evidence for some people to conclude that dogs think logically. And I'm not quite sure that I follow that. I mean, it's not like the dog is sitting there like surmising, like, I did not go down the left path. Well, there's one option on the left. Uh, but at least it shows that dogs act logically. And why? Well, look at that first premise. It gives us two options. It says one of these two things have got to be true. And then the second premise takes away one of those possibilities. So we're left with just one more possibility, right? One more thing that could be true. The conclusion has to follow from these premises. And that is exactly what we're after in logic. If the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. We'll call this phenomenon necessary truth preserving or NTP for short. And in the book, Smith gives us three possible ways of describing this phenomenon. Number one, the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. Number two, it's not possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion not to be true. Number three, there's no way for the premises to be true without the conclusion being true. Now there are two important ideas here. The first one being premises true, conclusion true, but the second one being those words like guaranteed, uh, impossible without, stuff like that. What do those things mean? Well, let's look at a second argument to help us to understand this idea. We're gonna use my dog Cable as an example here, and uh, I wanna tell you right off the bat, I didn't name the dog, okay? My kids named the dog after that Marvel superhero. Everybody's always like, Cable Television? Why would you name it after Cable Television? No, it's not Cable Television, all right, people. Why would I name it that? But for reasons that will become clear here in a second, I'm not gonna tell you what kind of dog it is. So let's check this argument out. All Boston Terriers are dogs. Cable is a dog. Therefore, Cable is a Boston Terrier. Is this argument NTP necessary truth preserving? To help us understand here, I'm gonna give you a little diagram on your screen. And I want you to imagine that these are all the dogs that there are in the universe. Imagine there's some kind of dog apocalypse and this is what we have left. Now assume these premises are true. All Boston Terriers are dogs and Cable is a dog. Given those premises, is the conclusion true? Well, given those premises, it could be true. It could also be false though. Cable might be one of those Boston Terriers, but the fact that we said that he is a dog doesn't necessarily put him in that category of Boston Terriers. It puts him somewhere in the category of dogs, and that might be also overlapping with that category of Boston Terriers, but we're not sure given these premises. In other words, given the premises, the conclusion doesn't have to be true. The premises don't guarantee the conclusion. Now the conclusion does happen to be true, by the way. My dog is a Boston Terrier. In fact, that ugly dog on your screen there, that's my dog. However, this conclusion isn't true because of the premises. And by the way, this is a mistake I see students make often in the beginning of the course. They see that the premises are true, they happen to know that the conclusion is true, and then they think that this is an NTP kind of an argument. But they just know that the conclusion is true from some other reason, from outside knowledge, right? Because it's obviously true or something like that. But it's not true given the premises. It's not that the premises guarantee that the conclusion is true. So being NTP, being necessary truth preserving, is not just that your premises are true and your conclusion is true. It's that the premises being true guarantees the truth of your conclusion. And what if we change it up a little bit? What if our argument instead said this, all Boston Terriers are dogs, Cable is a Boston Terrier, therefore Cable is a dog. What about this one? Is this one NTP? Well, look at the different categories here. All of the Boston Terriers are inside of that category of dog, so anything in that category of Boston Terrier is also gonna be in that category of dog. 
So these premises, assuming they're true, guarantee the truth of the conclusion. This is an NTP. This is a necessary truth preserving argument. Now, what exactly is it about the premises that guarantees the truth of the conclusion? Well, let's look at some more examples. Argument four, Tangles is gray and Maisie is furry, therefore Maisie is furry. Argument five, philosophy is interesting and logic is rewarding, therefore logic is rewarding. Argument six, John is Susan's brother, therefore Susan is John's sister. And argument seven, the glass on the table contains water, therefore the glass on the table contains H2O. Now each of these arguments is NTP necessary truth preserving. The premises being true guarantees the truth of the conclusion. But in each of these cases, how do they do so? Well, looking at argument four and five, it looks like they do so in the same way. It looks like both of them give you in that first premise, two things that are true, and then in the conclusion, just reiterates that one of them is true. In other words, they share a common structure. A and B is true, therefore B is true. And notice also, you could substitute whatever you wanted in for A and B. As long as that first premise is true, then the conclusion is going to be true. So four and five are structured in such a way that they are NTP, that if their premises are true, the conclusion has to be true based solely on the structure. And therefore, any sequence of propositions, any argument with that structure, that form, will also be NTP. Is six the same way? Is six structured in such a way that it's NTP? That its premises being true guarantees the truth of its conclusion? Well, six is NTP, necessary truth preserving, because of the brother-sister relation. If a boy is the brother of a girl, then the girl is the sister of that boy. But six is not NTP because of its structure. If it were so, if it were the structure that made it necessary truth preserving, then as long as it had that same structure, we could really substitute whatever we wanted in for those terms, and it would still be NTP. It'd still be necessary truth preserving. What kind of structure does six have? Well, it's something like this. A has some specific kind of relation to B, therefore B has some different kind of relation to A, or as I have it on your screen, A is X related to B, therefore B is Y related to A. And notice, that premise is not gonna guarantee the truth of that conclusion just based on structure. And we know that because we could substitute things in for those terms and they would be counter examples of that. The premise would be true, but the conclusion false. So for example, argument eight, John is Susan's friend, therefore Susan is John's aunt. Now notice I substituted two different kinds of relations in there. And all of a sudden my premise is true, but my conclusion could be false. So it can't be the case that the structure itself is guaranteeing that this argument is necessary truth preserving. So let me give you another counter example, substituting terms in for those uh, A's and B's. Argument nine, John is Bill's brother, therefore Bill is John's sister. In other words, it's not even just the brother-sister relationship that makes this NTP, let alone just the structure. It's also the case that John and Susan have to be boy and girl. A brother must be a boy and a sister must be a girl, and so John being a boy's name and Susan being a girl's name, we're assuming that John and Susan are boy and girl respectively. Actually, this is Smith's uh, example. Obviously the Australians don't listen to Johnny Cash. But the point is that six is NTP, not due to the structure, but due to the brother-sister relationship and due to some facts about John and Susan, namely that one is a boy and one is a girl. Four and five, the NTP was due to the structure of the arguments, A and B, therefore B. And in fact, we could substitute whatever we wanted to in for those two terms, and we would still get valid arguments. So here are some examples. Argument 10, Bill is boring and Ben is asleep, therefore Ben is asleep. Argument 11, Jill is snoring and Jack is awake, therefore Jack is awake. And notice these two different arguments are the same structure as four and five, so they're also valid just based on the structure. Now is seven that way? Is seven NTP? due to its structure alone. Here's argument seven. The glass on the table contains water, therefore the glass on the table contains H2O. Now is it the structure of this argument that makes it NTP? It seems like it's more facts about science that makes this NTP. It's the fact that water is materially identical to H2O that makes this necessary truth preserving. And it's not the structure itself. The structure here seems to be something more like 
G has W, therefore G has H. And again, that premise doesn't guarantee the truth of that conclusion. And I know because we substitute in some other things for those two terms and we get counterexamples to this. So, argument 12, the glass on the table contains sand, therefore the glass on the table contains H2O. Or argument 13, the glass on the table contains water, therefore the glass on the table contains N2O. Same structure, right? Same exact structure, but the premise is true and the conclusion is false. So it can't be the case that this structure guarantees that seven is NTP. So four and five are NTP due to their structure and six and seven are NTP for other reasons. Now it's not the case that those other reasons aren't important things to know or great things to know about, but hopefully you see why four and five being NTP due to their structure would be something you'd want to know, right? You'd want to know what kind of structure guarantees the truth of the conclusion like that. What's great here is that if we know about these forms, if we know about these structures that guarantee the truth of their conclusion, then every time we evaluate an argument with that structure, we'll know that the conclusion is guaranteed as long as the premises are true. And this is exactly the kind of NTP that we're interested in in logic. We want to know about arguments with structures that are such that if their premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. And then we can apply that knowledge to all the arguments with that same structure. Let's get another term out there to make this a little bit easier to talk about. If an argument is valid, it is NTP number one, and number two, that NTP is due to the structure of that argument, to the structure of the propositions in that argument. If the argument is valid, we'll say that the conclusion is a logical consequence of the premises. And we'll say that an argument is invalid if it's not valid. Now, as Smith says in the book, this is a very imprecise definition of validity, right? We're gonna wanna get a lot more precise. We're gonna wanna know exactly what it is we're talking about. But for right now, this is gonna have to do to get us an understanding of what we're doing, what we're looking for in logic. And then he brings up Alfred Tarski and Aristotle. Aristotle is really the guy that started this whole thing, as far as we know. He's the guy that, uh, set out a system of logic that we would uh, check out the different structures, that we could uh, evaluate them to see, is the case that the premises being true guarantees the truth of the conclusion. So in logic, we wanna know what kind of forms or structures are valid or invalid. How do we go about doing that? Well, remember in argument two, the way I did it, uh, I gave you that little diagram, you know, that, that imaginary scenario of all the dogs being reduced to those six or however many dogs there were. And we saw that those premises could be true with the conclusion not being true. We can't do that every single time, right? I mean, that just would be absurd. Imagine every time you did math and you wanted to add two numbers up, two huge numbers, you had to think something like, imagine having 1,257 tomatoes and then 2,874 tomatoes, put them together. Is it possible to not have 4,131 tomatoes? Ah, well then 1,257 plus 2,874 must equal 4,131. That would be crazy. No, in math instead, we have a set of rules, steps, that we follow these steps and every single time given certain input, we get the exact right output. And it doesn't take any kind of imagination or any kind of ingenuity on our parts. We don't have to worry about it just applying to tomatoes or just applying to the number 1,257 or whatever number it was that I said. Well, we want something exactly like that for validity. We want to know precisely what it is we're talking about when we say validity, and we want some sort of method for determining whether something is valid that is foolproof, you know, won't take any ingenuity or any kind of imagination on our part, and general will apply to all arguments with that specific structure. And that's something we're going to be looking for in this class. What kind of rules or laws do we set out to know whether an argument is valid or invalid? And once we've got that, we'll know how to reason well, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. For next time, please read the rest of section 1.4, pages 19 through 21, where we'll talk about good reasoning.